Hello everyone, welcome to another installment of Insecurity. This is episode 22 and today we want to talk about email security. We have only half an hour so we're going to go as fast as we can but yet still make it as good as it could. We, again we have Tom and he's going to explain to us everything about email security in 30 minutes. Yeah, we've got a whole lot to go over. I'm going to try to keep this as simple and uh, non-nerdtastic as possible but we might get into that. So I guess the first thing is, I guess we should start, what are the two different types of email? Or what's the major form of email that we get, and that's uh, webmail and a client-side SMTP mail. Right, right. So so most people use either you know, an email program like IMAP uh, or a connection like IMAP um, on an email program like Outlook or Thunderbird or Apple Mail or even if you look on you know on your phone you've got corporate email chances are you're using IMAP maybe you're using Exchange depends on your company um, but it's either that or you know you go to a web page somewhere and you've got all your messages and that's really the two main ways you get email today there's also a, a something called a pop connection if you remember that from back in the day and what that is is your computer asks the server, says, hey, are there any messages? And the server goes, yeah, sure. And it gives you all the messages, and you're storing them on your computer. It's great because, you know, you can use a server that has basically no storage. The bad thing is if your computer blows up or breaks down or your hard drive dies, you just lost all of your email. You have to store all of your email on your computer. That's why we don't really use that anymore. Or you have two different machines and your phone, and now you get everything in triplicate. Right. Right. And, or not at all. Or let's say your home computer grabs it first, your phone then can't grab it. And the problem with that is it's still being used by a lot of legacy softwares like your your probably your ISP provided email address, mm -hmm. which if we haven't said, never, ever, ever use. It's a very bad idea. Don't ever use ISP email addresses. Uh, first off, it, they're not very good. And second off, if you use, you know, Tom Webster at woh.rr.net.mailserver.com. You kind of look dumb. Go out and get yourself a, a Gmail address or a Yahoo address. They're and, better. And the other part is if you move and you move outside your ISP's jurisdiction, you lose everything. Just yep. like when you finish college and your and your college said there's no alumni email accounts. Like for me. You just, I mean, what are you going to do? You just spent four years telling everybody, and now you have to tell them again. So, yeah. and they're not IMAP or they're not secure SMTP, as we're going to get into in a second. So, it's just not worth it. Just like you said, yeah. Google. The, the general PSA is, it's basically if you've got a company email or you know an ISP email or a school email, don't tie that to everything. Use something like Gmail, something you can control. So, so at this point, I'm assuming everyone's either using a web browser or a mail client. Let's, let's, I guess let's start with how secure is each one? Well, in the grand scheme of things, probably the email client on your computer would be a little less secure than webmail, depending on a lot of variables. There's a whole lot of things in that, but generally... If you're using, you know, Outlook at home, your computer is always online. Uh, you can get infected with malware pretty easily, and the whole thing, could, the virus or spyware, could search through your mail and email itself to your contacts. It happens a lot. Um, it happens with webmail too, but less often. Um, well, I get, what I was going to get at is um, recently. I mean, Gmail has always, I think, been HTTPS, which we'll get to in a second. Yeah. Yahoo just flipped the switch. I think, I think Hotmail is already HTTPS, but when you connect to from your mail sir, from your mail client, that's not always the case. Or you may have to actually pay more for the secure connection. I guess that's what I was trying to get at first. Yeah. So I know, and I'm not sure if they've changed this, but back in the day, Yahoo used to charge for using a secured IMAP connection. So if uh, what happens is, you know, we've talked about secure connections. We've talked about the security that banks use and other, you know, big high-profile websites like Amazon. It's called SSL or, you know, 
it's it's just a way to encrypt traffic in a network going from point A to point B. It's a tunnel that no one can get into except for you and the server you're talking to. Really cool tech, but there's a way to encapsulate or protect other protocols, including the stuff your mail client uses. Depending on how that's set up, it could be through a secure connection. So if you hook up, you know, Mozilla Thunderbird, if you hook it up to Gmail, by default, Gmail says, hey, use the secure connection, please. And it'll it'll push those settings to your mail client. Your mail client says, okay, and it uses secure connections. Uh, some email services won't do that. Some email services will say, yeah, no, sure, you can pull down all your mail. But it does so in clear text, which means anyone in the middle, and you've kind of got to know how the Internet works. It's not you talking to a server. It's you talking to a box that your ISP has got, talking to another box, talking to some switches and routers out on the Internet, talking to some more boxes, and then eventually to a server. And it makes all these hops to try to get to the thing you're trying to connect to. It's a really cool technology, but the problem is unless you're using a secure connection, those boxes in the middle of that transaction could potentially read anything and everything that's going through the wires. And we know that the NSA is doing that today. So basically, it's, it's we want to first start off by saying email is probably the worst form of communication if you wanted anything to be secure. It may be secure on your computer. You may be connected at, uh, by SSL or secure or a secure tunnel to your email client or to the Google servers or your ISP servers. But once it leaves, that's it. But once it gets yeah, it leaves, it's gone. But once it gets to you, Tom, it gets re it gets re encrypted not re encrypted again, but it's secure again. But everything in the middle is just open for people to take. Right. And if you're connected through SSL, that's not the case. The people just see some you know, static, some encrypted traffic. They don't know what it is, but they're going to pass along the chain. I can't do anything with this. I can't even read it. So even if the NSA was listening in, unless they've broken encryption, you can pretty much be rest assured that whatever's happened between point A and point B is fine. And no one's going to read it. No one's going to, you know, scarf it up and be like, oh, look, I've got your email address, and I'm going to sell it on a list, and you'll get 50 cents for it. So, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, no, you go ahead. But but so the, the new idea, and this is fairly new technology, is, what is it, secure SMTP? I think that's what we were discussing before, where the, the email providers are trying to make all these hops as secure as possible. The problem is... It's an all-or-nothing uh, transaction because if I said send something via secure SMTP to a service that doesn't have it, it's going to be garbled to the other person. There's no way to decrypt it. Right. There's there's a couple different ways that they're trying to make email more secure. Uh, the issue is uh, most of the time we're working with the lowest common denominator. Most of the time you have to send it insecurely to another endpoint because there's no other way, because they don't accept email any other way. Because, you know, we've got to make sure it works for everyone. And yeah, there's a couple of different places that will make sure the message is sent securely, that you can verify where it was sent from, and you can be rest assured that the email was sent securely. But it's not foolproof, and realistically, you don't have much or, in most cases, any control over whether or not your email is sent or received securely. So if you're trying to be sneaky, if you're trying to communicate with people over email, just be aware there's really no good way to do it securely unless you use a couple technologies we'll mention later. Well, I'm ready to mention those technologies. Are you? Uh, I, I guess I am. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Do we have anything else with just generic email? Um, I, I do want to mention that webmail tends to be a little bit more secure just because you are you don't have the hops in between. If Google is storing your email, you go to Google over a secured connection, over your web browser that's using SSL. You go to Gmail through a secure tunnel, and you can interact with your email right there. Now, sending it, you still run into the same problems that all email has, but at least looking at your email and moving it to folders and stuff like that, processing it, it's going to be more secure more often than not. But the technologies we're going to talk about today, and they're 
they're really nerdy. They're kind of kind of out there as far as computer skill set goes. But if you're interested, it's worth doing some research. The first one, there's two main types of what we call email encryption out there. The first one is S-MIME, and we're not really going to mention that too much. Um, we're going to talk about PGP, or pretty good privacy. Um, there's a lot of paid options to do PGP. There's a lot of free options to do PGP, and they all play nicely with each other because just like the Internet itself, PGP is built on standards. It's, a bunch of guys got together, and they said, hey, look, I, I wrote this thing, this set of standards for how to do email encryption, and I'm calling it PGP. Everyone should do it this way. And everyone basically agreed, and they said, yeah, that sounds great. And now we have a standard. Now these pieces can communicate using PGP. And for everyone who doesn't know, PGP has been around probably since the early 90s, if not before that. It's been around a very long time. Yeah. So, I mean, so we start off with PGP, and the first thing I guess you need to do is you need to install a PGP client. Which is not hard to do. You go to PG. It was a pgptools.com. Um, there's a lot of different places. Where you now can I'm on a Mac that. and you're on a Linux machine, and the Windows are all. I mean, all of them are basically. If you search up PGP and encryption, it'll take you to the website and really, really simple directions. And they're as simple as you can make them with what we're about to explain, and right. so you install it. And it, it walks you through a whole bunch of steps on how you need to create a key, uh, put your key on a key server, uh, how to disseminate your key, and what all the keys mean. And and that's and that's pretty much it. The problem is is that you can lock yourself out or get or do it wrong if you miss one of these one of these little steps. Right. And and keep in mind if you play around with PGP. It's stuff that you send or receive that's encrypted with PGP. It doesn't do it automatically for all mail. If you're playing around with PGP, you can still send and receive unencrypted emails that aren't even touched. So if you're feeling interested, give it a try. You're not really going to hurt anything. Now, if you take your family photos and you PGP encrypt them and send them to your grandmother, without her installing PGP and going through the same steps that you did and you guys trading keys, which we'll get into, She's not going to be able to read it, and if that's your only backup and you lose your keys, you're kind of out of luck at that point. Um, PGP is really, really good security. If you don't have the keys and you're not an intended recipient, you just can't read it. I mean, there's, there's ways to crack really, 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 really old PGP keys, but anything you make today or even anything you made five years ago it's still going to be really, really secure. And you can't really even try to crack the old stuff unless you own a supercomputer or a bank of supercomputers. So let's start with the first step. After I install the client, the first thing they ask you to do is create a key. Yep. So what does that mean? So creating a key is exactly what it sounds like. You're going to create you know, a long, random string of cryptographic data, and that key, the thing that you make is now your identity. It means this key belongs to me, to my email address, and I can use it for signing messages and encrypting messages. And the difference between those two is you can sign something, which it takes your message, does some math on it, puts a timestamp on it, and then puts a little block of jumbled characters and says PGP signature on it. Now, if someone were so inclined and they said, uh, I don't believe you really sent that, or, you know, I think this has been tampered with, can you verify that, and you've got a PGP signature, they can compare it to your public key and say, yes, this was sent by you at this time, and the message has not been verified, or has not been uh, modified. You, you, you skip this step. So when you make your key, you're really creating two keys. You're creating a public right. key and a private key. And yes. the importance there is the private key is yours and yours only that you need to keep safe and no one else can have. Nobody yeah. else can have. The public key, you could post anywhere you want. Everywhere. And it's actually and it's actually recommended, and uh, uh, PGP Tools for the, for the Mac will ask you to post it on a whole bunch of different key servers for people to find. Yep. 
And this way, if someone else is using PGP and they've got it turned on in their client to, you know, hey, if this guy has got a PGP key, just encrypt the email by default. A lot of clients do that, and it's a really cool way to make things secure, um, you know, without going through too much extra hassle. When you send an email to someone it doesn't know about, it looks through a list of key servers, and it goes, oh, yeah, Tom. Tom's got a PGP key already. Cool. It downloads that, encrypts the email, and ships it off. Now, the private key, it really means private. Don't go storing it on Dropbox. Don't put it on Google Drive. Don't put it on your web server somewhere. You know, it's it's supposed to be really, really private. You can take an encrypted backup and store that somewhere. Uh, just make sure it's safe. Keep it in a thumb drive, put it in a safety deposit box, whatever. Just if you put it on the internet, assume that it's going to get hacked out of somewhere. Dropbox has had issues with this in the past where people, where they opened up access to everyone accidentally. You want to make sure your PGP keys stay secure. Well, by the way, LastPass has a secure note for PGP key. Yes. So if you're inclined, you it's not it's also not a bad idea maybe it, with your really super strong master password and two factor authentication to put it up in LastPass just in case. Absolutely. So so how so I guess now we made these two we made a public key we made a private key and one of the other options it asks you is how many uh, what's the bit length twenty forty eight used to be the standard and now they're saying forty ninety six again anything over I think was it seven sixty eight at this point is is so strong that it will never be hacked in your lifetime yeah seven sixty eight can be cracked with a lot of effort or a lot of money uh, or both. But it takes someone that really, really, really wants to read your email. 1024 is still being safe for now. Uh, but yeah, if you get 2048 and above, you're good for a long time. It's it's pretty good privacy, I've got to say. Now, the next option, if I remember this in order, was a length. Like, how many years do you want to store this? Yep. And, and, uh, okay. Go ahead. So some people like uh, Apple for their PGP keys. They say every two years, we're, when we put out security notices or certain patches, we're going to sign it with our PGP key. Here's our public key. You can verify anything we put on the site by using our public key. Great. I can verify that they give security warnings and recommendations. Um, they said, you know, every two years this key will expire and we're going to make a new one. And that's really up to personal preference. If you think, oh, I think this key will be useful for as long as I care about it, basically forever. You don't have to put an expiration date on it. My key, I've got a five-year expiration date. So after that happens, I will take my key, archive it, and then make a new one. It's kind of like, try to think of a good physical analogy, but I can't really think of it. Well, it's, it's basically, if that key ever gets out, without your knowledge, it's going to expire in some set amount of time. So if it is two years, I guess you only have two years to really worry about it. Right. And then it goes again. It, I mean, this is if you have no idea that it got if it got leaked. Mm -hmm. I mean, as soon as you find out that like your credit card or anything gets stolen, the first thing you do is you change it, which is exactly what you want is supposed to do. This basically forces you every two years, five years, ten years, whatever it is, to say, okay, now i got to change it up again. Right. And you don't want to do it too, too often. Really, I think yearly should be your lowest level because you have to give people your public keys so they can communicate with you. You've got to find a buddy and you've got to trade public keys so you can do email encryption. If you're changing that you know, every week, people are going to get stuck at you really, really fast. And you're going to fill up their key log with a whole bunch of stuff that you just don't want to do. So, so don't change it every week. Okay, so, and before we move on to exactly what's go, uh, how you should do this, so what happens, I guess, so you make your key, you go to the key logger, and I guess the next thing is, is asking your friends. So the first thing I do is I find Tom's public key, which is, I guess, on his website, or you look at the various key servers, and you can import them. And as you import them, it says it verifies. Okay, this is you can put, you can either paste the public key in, or uh, like I said, with the server you click add, and that's how you create your database. 
And as soon as you write the email, you can say, if the, like you said before, if it's found in there, it will automatically encrypt it. But, okay, then it gets sent. What happens when it gets sent, let's say, from me to you? So what happens is your whatever tool you're using, I'm a fan of Enigmail. It's a plugin for Mozilla Thunderbird. Really cool, really slick interface, easy to use. Outlook has got a couple of them out there, but they're not great. Uh, the Mac has got some awesome tools. So what happens is PGP takes the contents of your email, and it looks at the recipients, and it takes your message, and it takes any public keys from the recipients, and also takes your own public key in most cases, and it encrypts the message using those keys. It turns it into a random block of random characters. There is no even slight recognition to your original message. It just looks like this giant block of gibberish text. And then it ships that. It sends it off. Now, hold on. Oh, no, I'm not using a secure connection. Oh, well, that's fine. You just sent a random block of text. No one can read it anyway. Oh, no, Google got hacked. All of my email is all over the Internet. Well, your PGP messages, they're just random blocks of static text. It's... It's fine. No one can read it anyway unless they've got the keys. And it, it doesn't matter who in the chain gets hacked or who in the chain is looking at your email. If you send PGP messages, not even Google themselves can read the contents of those messages. It's a truly a trust-no-one system. It is the best type of encryption because it relies on you and the person you want to communicate with and no one else. And, it's, and the other issue is... so. Let's say, and this happened to me, I uh, I was using, we're going to talk about web client uh, PGP technologies in a second. I was reading something on my Gmail on the website, and I couldn't read it, and I said, I swore I had Tom's key, but I didn't on that exact client, so I had to go, go find it again. So if you get a random blob, you need to make sure whatever you're reading it on has that key which also gets, again, tedious, but provides even more security. So even though Tom and I have shared keys on my laptop, if I go to the library and I don't have Tom's key installed there, I can't do anything with it. Right. It, it, I mean, you, it is seriously bulletproof when it comes to, when it comes to that. But yeah. I wanted to ask you, Tom, exactly. So like you said, it takes all our keys and makes a jumbled mess. So I guess it encrypts my – if I send you an email – for. It encrypts the email with your public key and yes. my private key, and when it gets to you, it uses the reverse. It uses your private key to match yes. up and my public key to match exactly. up. Okay. Exactly. Now, it also, in most mail clients, uh, if you just send an email just like that, um, you won't be able to read your own sent mail because it's not being encrypted with your public key. Luckily, most email clients and most versions of the PGP tools you're using will automatically use your public key and whoever else you've selected when sending a message so you can read that. But yeah, it uses, if I were sending a message, it uses my private key and whoever I'm sending it to is public key, encrypts the message, and then the reverse happens. And mathematically, it's really cool because the mathematic formulas line up in such a way that the inverse does the opposite or the inverse will decrypt. Oh, which is, which is, I mean, the way that it does it is almost magical. Yeah, it's, there's a whole lot of math behind it, and it makes a whole lot of sense, but it's, it's pretty nerdy. It's pretty out there. Check out the PGP Wikipedia article for a lot more information. It gets really, really in-depth with this stuff, and it is super, super cool. Now, can I send email to multiple people as long as I have their public key? Absolutely. So they'll all be able to decrypt it. Yep. Now, what happens if grandma, I send it to everyone and grandma, and grandma doesn't have it? Are we, are we stuck there? Yes. If grandma doesn't have a key and you've chosen to encrypt your message, most of the time your email client will say, dude, uh, what's grandma's public key? And the email client usually gives you the option to send anyway because, you know, who cares about grandma? And it'll send the message to Grandma, but she'll get a random block of text that she won't be able to read at all. Um, most of the time, the email client will stop you and say, hey, you forgot a key here. We're missing one. Do you want me to look it up? Do you want to paste it in? What do you want to do? So that's, that's really the biggest barrier to entry is just like all trust no one point-to-point -point encryption solutions, 
you've got to get everyone on board. Everyone you want to communicate with has to be using PGP, or else it's useless. Because if I sent a secret message to to the insecurity group, and and then I forwarded that message unencrypted to Grandma, well, it doesn't matter. Now now the plain text version is out floating around the internet. We don't know who has it or who's read it. And the security is really only as good as you make it. If there's any any break in the chain, like we've talked about, you can assume it's all compromised. And I mean, we have a few minutes left, but but I want to talk about just some the one webmail client that I can think of that's doing it. I don't know, seventy five percent right is an extension at least for uh, for Chrome is called Mailvelope. Which is just you basically it goes to the same steps of you making your key and everything else. It's a reduced set of options, so you put your key in, it does the whole thing, and you type out your Gmail, you click the little button, it goes right in the compose window, it mashes it all up, and then you can send it there. And for most people, that's good enough. It's not great, but for right now, with all this technology we just explained, they found a way to do it online, and it is a Chrome extension, so so it go it makes it easier. The only problem is that it stores the key files locally, so if you take it from another computer, you still have to re-import all those keys, which I don't know right. if it's a good thing or not. That it, it The good thing is it doesn't store it, and Google doesn't store it, but that means that you have to go and import your key and everyone else's key when you move computers or you do different things. Right, and also, I mean, you're typing the original message into a web page that Google controls. So if you're trying to hide something from Google or, you know, let's say the NSA has backdoors into Google and they're watching everything you type into Gmail, using Mailvelope isn't going to protect you from that. Will it protect you from, you know, routers along the path and, you know, people casually snooping through email? Yeah, but uh, think about how much security you need and then make the assessment. And, and also, and, yeah. It's it also a whole bunch of links to programs. Again, it's and we keep on saying this, and I'll say it probably once again. Before you do this, before it becomes critical that you need to send an encrypted message, work on getting this all working first. This is not. Uh, I'm just going to follow. It's following the directions, but it's it's not going to be ten seconds. It's going to be a day or two as you do it and you get stuck and it's on the simplest things. Wait, I have to make a PGP key now. Where is it? Where's the button that says generate? And then you have to go to the user groups and read there, which by the way are excellent. The, everyone will help you along this along the way. And just get everything working doesn't happen overnight. You need a few days. And as soon as you get it working, then you can experiment. But one of the things you're going to learn is that you can't just check it on your phone. You can't check it on Google Glass. You can't check it on your smartwatch. You, basically, you can only check it in your email client or your basically yeah, your email client or your web client if you have like I said, Melvelope installed to decrypt the key. Yeah, it's it's a classic battle between convenience and security, and it's it's extremely apparent when you use PGP. I mean, we will say that, like we said in the beginning, if you want to communicate this way, it's great, and and I guess and you have your five friends that you want to do this with. You know what? It's a fun thing, and you know what? If all your emails are encrypted, then everything is safe, and it could be anything. Because if the NSA does start tracking you, anything that you said encrypted will be immediately flagged as important because, hey, why did you encrypt this and not the other thing? Yeah, it's, it's really cool because the NSA stores all encrypted traffic by default or all encrypted emails. Make them work. Make things harder for them. Just when you send pictures, cat pictures to random people, encrypt those. They'll love trying to crack that. And then when they do, they'll get a whole bunch of images of cats because at the end of the day, at some point in the future, a very lo far far time from now, they will get it. But hopefully, hopefully whatever you were sending is not irrelevant anymore. Right. So anyway, we have 30 seconds left, but I'm done. That's all I had. Okay. Let's say bye, and we'll see you next week. See you guys. Bye.